Definitely. So this week we are transitioning into chapter 19, and there's a lot that goes on, but I'm splitting it up into three different events. In each one of these events, there's um, something missing as far as it becoming what it should be or what it could be. So they all have something in common, and we're going to see what it looks like for them to have life without Christ versus having life with Christ, and what that link is that they need to be able to get to the point to where they have Christ. Everybody follow? Everybody with me? Awesome. So let's look first at incomplete converts. Verses 1 through 10. Converts, like they, they have not fully converted yet. So we see in chapter, or chapter 19, the first couple of verses, that these men are coming up, and it looks like they're probably affiliated with Apollos. Because if you remember from last week, Apollos understood some of it, but he didn't know that the Messiah had actually come. You guys remember that? Just not yes. Okay, cool. And so the problem was that he had been baptized under John, so he understood the repentance had come, or they needed to repent, and the Messiah was coming, but he did not know that the Messiah had come. And so these men are in the same situation. And so Paul runs into them, and he talks to them, and they had an incomplete understanding of salvation in Christ. So in verse 2, Paul asked them if they received the Holy Spirit when they believed. They had no idea who the Holy Spirit was. And so clearly they had not accepted the Holy Spirit, or they had not known the Holy Spirit so they said, no, Paul immediately started discussing with them who the Holy Spirit is. And so he's telling about, you know, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is the one that's here with us now because Christ has gone back to the Father. And he's the one that kind of brings us into this relationship with Christ. And so when they heard the Holy Spirit, heard about the Holy Spirit, it says that they immediately were baptized. So they immediately repented. They trusted in Christ because they had the full understanding of what it took to be one with Christ or to be linked with Christ. And so they finally knew the truth of the Messiah. And so they had the spirit of anticipation. They were excited about the fact that Messiah was coming, but now that he was here and he had come, they were even more excited and ready to jump into it and get started. So like if you know what you're getting for Christmas, but you can't get it yet. It's like if your parents are like, hey, I'm going to get you, I don't know, what do you guys get now? Money. A phone, money, clothes. So like you've got a jacket that you've been wanting for a year, and your parents have not gotten it, to you, gotten it for you yet, but they're like, hey, I'm getting you this jacket for Christmas, but you can't have it until Christmas. Well, like you go with them to get it, and then you can't get it. Yes. I think that's torture, though. It is. They were excited about the fact that they were on the verge of having this relationship with Christ, and so whenever Paul tells them, hey, the Messiah's already come, they're like, absolutely, we're going to get into this. We're going to get ready. We're going to go. We're going to be a part of this. And so they surrender, and they trust in Christ. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. Paul lays his hands on them. They start speaking in tongues and prophesying, but they, there's this period to where the Holy Spirit proves himself and proves Paul to the people around them. And so the thing that they were lacking was a genuine relationship. They were lack, lacking this relationship with Christ. They had the knowledge of everything that happened in the Old Testament, which if you guys remember, none of the um, New Testament books have been written yet. And so everything that they knew about the Messiah was coming from the Old Testament or from you know, the leaders, the disciples that were teaching about him. And so all they have was the Old Testament, which talks about the coming Messiah, but not the actual Messiah being here on earth. And so whenever they had the opportunity to surrender to Christ, it was they were given new life. They were given the Holy Spirit. They were able to have this relationship with their Creator, with their Savior. And so they heard the truth, and they were ready to repent and ready to go. And so after, Paul say, or after these men were saved, Paul spent three months teaching in the synagogue at Ephesus. So he does the same thing he does everywhere else. He goes directly to the Jews, and he teaches them about Christ, and he, as usual, he faced a mixed crowd. There were some that were willing to repent, some that were willing to trust in Christ, to have this relationship. There were others that the Bible says they hardened their hearts. And when it talks about hardening your heart, it's basically saying that you're living in defiance to God. So you know what's true, but instead of surrendering, you're rejecting it. Instead of saying, yes, I will have a relationship with Christ, I will humble myself before me, say, no, I don't want God. I don't want you, I don't care, I'll deal with the consequences. And so these men in the synagogue were willing to say that. And so they were defiant against God, and eventually Paul left the synagogue and went somewhere else. But these ones that converted to Christ, it, Paul discipled them for years, and eventually got them to the point where they went out and they shared the gospel all over Asia. So Paul went to this philosophical school called, um, where did it go? Tyrannus? Sorry. Yes, Tyrannus. He goes, he goes to the school of Tyrannus. Which, interestingly enough, Tyrannus means um, our tyrant. So either the philosophy professor or the person that owned this was a tyrant or he was just kind of a jerk and none of the students liked him. I'm sure you have, have teachers that are like that. That one teacher, you're like, man, they're always mean to me. 
Just start calling them a tyrant. See what happens. But that's the nickname that they gave this person, and it's in Scripture. So now it's there forever. But they call him a tyrant. So he was there. But Paul spent two years teaching in this school, teaching them about Christ, discipling those men that had been converted, those 12. And then verse 10 tells us that it took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So how is it possible that everyone in Asia heard the word of God within two years? I mean, because Asia is a pretty big place, right? Yes, yes. It's like a tree. It ties back into the lesson from last week talking about impact. So our lives, if we live our lives for Christ, if we really surrender to Christ and get deep into this relationship with Him, it's going to have an impact on other people. And even though Paul physically did not go to every single household or every place in Asia, the gospel did. Because Paul was faithful to the calling that God put on his life. He was able to disciple others to go and share the gospel who did the same. And it just kind of grew and exploded overnight to where people could literally go to every household all over Asia and share the gospel because the impact that Paul made. So that was awesome. So let me ask you a question. These guys were incomplete because they lacked the relationship that they needed to understand Christ. They had the knowledge, but they lacked the relationship. You guys understand the difference between that? Like you can know about somebody without actually knowing them. And this is what they were doing, and this is what a lot of people do now. So how are we made complete? So we saw what happened when they met Paul. They became a follower of Christ instead of just being baptized by John. For them, when they heard the truth, it clicked. Have you ever had an aha moment? Like, you know, you're staring at something, you're trying to figure it out, and all of a sudden you're like, there it is. All the time. time. Give me an example of an aha moment. Like you can't think of something, and all of a sudden it comes to your mind. Sure, we can go with the blonde moment. (laughs) Do you have an example? What you got? Gotcha. Hey, that's a perfect example. Like, they had the truth of Christ in front of them, but they couldn't actually see it until the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. Yes. I think that's like every man's nightmare. When we go to look for something and it's staring us right in the face and we can't find it. Yes. Awesome. So that's the exact same thing that these men had. As soon as the Holy Spirit revealed to them Christ, they had that aha moment like, this is exactly what we've been looking for. And so they're able to, to, to do this. And, you know, this is where they were. They knew about repentance and they knew the Messiah was to come, but they didn't realize that he had already been. So we know they're willing to follow Christ because they'd already had the head knowledge about repentance, but they were missing the relationship. When the opportunity came for them to fully surrender, they did, and they were indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and we see evidence of that through them speaking in tongues and prophesying. But like I said earlier, the reason we see signs like this is because they didn't have the Holy Spirit to kind of check to see if, or didn't have Scripture to check and see if it was true. And so God used miracles and other acts to prove that He was working in the lives of people. And I'll I'll mention that in a a minute as well. But just like Apollos, they, they had the knowledge, but they were missing something. They were lacking something. They were missing that connecting link that was going to get them to Christ, and that link was that relationship. So for us to be complete converts, for us to be able to to be a follower of Christ, we have to have that relationship. Because the knowledge by itself is not going to be enough. Because you can know something without it impacting your life. You can know something without it changing your life. And what's really cool is like these 12 men that are mentioned here, we never know what their names are. The Bible never tells us, you know, this man was named this, this, and this, but we do know that they had a major impact on the world because Scripture tells us that these men were the very ones that helped to found, to found the church in Ephesus. And also they went out and they shared the gospel all over Asia. So just because we don't know their name does not mean they didn't have an impact in the world around them. You don't have to be famous to make an impact. You don't have to be famous to leave a legacy, like we talked about last week, for you to be able to make a major move for God. And so this missing link was a relationship. And so here's the thing. There are people in the room that are in the same boat. A lot of you have grown up in church. You've been raised in church. You know all the Sunday school answers. You know exactly what to say when somebody asks you a question. But the real question is, do you have that relationship with Christ? You know, you can know what's right, but it doesn't mean that you believe it or that you live it out. And that's what a lot of these men were doing. 
before they had this relationship with Christ, before they had the Holy Spirit in their lives, there's people in churches all across the world on a weekly basis. They know the right answers. They know what to say. They know how to act externally, but God's never changed their heart. And so you know how to respond, but your life doesn't reflect that the Holy Spirit's present in your life. When the Holy Spirit came into these men's men's lives, there was immediate evidence. There was change. They immediately got to work and started sharing the gospel and growing in their faith. What evidence is there in your life that you made a decision not just to trust Christ with your mind, but also with your heart? What fruit is there in your life that you're growing? Or is there a missing link? Are you missing that genuine relationship with Christ? Second, the imposturing charlatans. Imposturing is a word that I may have made up. But it's people that maliciously try to deceive you, and then charlatans is kind of redundant because it's people that falsely claim to have special knowledge or skill or fraud. So verses 11 through 20, I think, is one of the funniest stories in Scripture, at least part of it. So Paul is walking down in 11 and 12, and like people are grabbing his handkerchief, they're grabbing his cloak and his apron, and like they're being healed. And people are taking them to people that are possessed by demons and sick, and God is healing them through these things. Again, because it's God showing that Paul is a messenger through the miracles that are being done. And those miracles don't bring people to salvation, but it's just evidence that God is moving. And so God is moving through them. And now what happens is, as you guys all know, if somebody is powerful, people get jealous, right? In school, if somebody is like the most popular person in the school, the first thing you try to do is either be like them or befriend them unless you just don't care about being popular. But, you know, you have somebody that has a brand new coat, and the next thing you know, everybody is dressing like them because it's the trendy thing. So Paul is over here, like, doing legitimate miracles because the Holy Spirit is moving through him. And so there's these seven sons of Sceva that notice that um, he's doing this. And so the seven sons of Sceva are supposed to be the seven sons of this high priest. And so they think that because... They are who they are. They can go and they can exercise demons. But what happens is they actually try to exercise demons in the name of Paul and of Jesus. And we find out that this is kind of a fishy situation to begin with because when you look back at like the history of the high priests of Israel and Jerusalem, there is no high priest named Sceva. So there's already a fraud there. So the high priest title is not earned, but he gave it to himself. And so his sons kind of suffered for that as well. But people believe that he was kind of like a traveling exorcist. And he would just go and exercise demons um, the Jewish way. They have a particular way they do it. And I don't know what in there. But I would think before Christ came that they were able to do those things because God was still with the people of Israel. So yeah, they probably could exercise demons before Christ came. But now that Christ is here, they can't do it anymore. And so they were jealous about the power that Paul had. And so they went and they were you know, bragging about the fact that there were these exorcists. And so they go up to this demon-possessed man. I'll just read it for you because I think it's hilarious. But um, it says, Seven sons of Sceva, this is verse 14, starting, a Jewish chief priest were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? Let's go to the next slide. You guys remember this in the, was it Infinity War? Endgame. Okay, to where, yeah, 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 you're right. Because after Vision gets killed and all that, spoiler alert. But, like, Scarlet Witch is there, and she's, like, pouring out her heart about how broken she is about the fact that Thanos killed Vision. And Thanos is just looking at her, and he's like, I don't even know who you are. This is pretty much what happens with the demon, with the seven sons of Sceva. Yes, I went there. But, so, they say that, you know, we're, we're exercising you in the name of Jesus and Paul. And he's like, look, I don't even know who you are. And he says, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Who are you? And says, the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them and subdued all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So he beat the clothes off of them. And they ran out in the middle of everyone, butt naked, embarrassed. Yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. But you just got to imagine, you know, they're, they're probably walking around with their chest puffed out. And they're like, man, we're about to go do this because we know the special words to get the power that we want to be able to do these things so that we can brag and say that we did this. They were looking for power without Christ. And so they go in, they tell the demon to come out. They thought just by mentioning Jesus or Paul that the demon would cower before them. It's kind of like if you go into a computer store and you look at the the cashier and you're like, in the name of Bill Gates, give me this PC. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to be like, who are you? I don't even know who you are. 
But they thought that just by invoking the name of Jesus and the name of Paul that this demon was going to submit to them. But instead, the demon calls their bluff. He's like, I know Jesus and I know about Paul, but I don't know you. Who am I or who are you to tell me what to do? You know, you guys like to say that to people. Who are you to tell me what to do? Because they have no authority over your life, right? Some of them don't. Some of them are your teachers and you just like to get smart. But they tried to use somebody else's name for their benefit, but they didn't know him. So if they don't know Jesus, they can't use his name or they can't assert his authority because they don't have that relationship. They don't know him. And so he calls her bluff. But as a result of this, we see in verses 17 through 19 that because these men, they tried to, to do this in Jesus' name or in Paul's name, and the demon called them out and beat them half to death, we see in verses 17 through 19 that revival actually breaks out in Ephesus. And so these men get embarrassed and kind of get thrown out of the city, but the whole town hears about it, or the whole city hears about it, because, you know, there's always gossips in towns. And so they're all talking about how these idiots try to exercise a demon in Paul in Jesus' name, and the demon actually admitted the fact that he knew Jesus and he knew Paul. And so it made them think, because when we'll get to this in a second, like this was a very like pagan, sorcery, witchcraft city. And so by most of them probably practiced demon worship. The fact that this demon that they worship submitted to Christ and submitted to Paul carried weight with some of them. And so it made them realize that, you know, there really is power and there really is authority in Christ. But it breaks out in revival. And what's really cool is what happens in verses 18 and 19. So let me read that for you. It says, Many also of those who have believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. So in the original language, what this is saying is there are people that have repented, but they're still struggling with the sin. And so they're, they're going back to dealing with sorcery, but then they come back and they repent. And this is back and forth to where finally they, they get to the point to where they're ready to give it up. And verse 19 tells us that as well. And it says, Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. And so these magicians or these sorcerers or witches or whatever you want to call them, all of these books was about 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, in modern times, this equates to about $6 million. Whoa. Like one piece of silver was a day's wage. So you're looking at 50,000 days worth of work just in these books that they're burning because they want to cut ties with everything in their past life. Yes, ma'am? <laughs> I don't know if I want to go that far back. Um, but they were willing to burn all of this because what they were saying is, look, we found the truth. We understand that it's not about the, this demon worship. It's not about this. It's not about just using someone's name. It's about being a genuine follower of Christ. And so we're willing to take everything that holds us to this world and get rid of it and destroy it. And so the thing that caused them to go back into sin over and over and over again, they destroyed it because they wanted to cut ties with their previous life. That's something that we should really consider, and we should probably do. If you're a Christian and there are things that cause you to sin, get rid of them. Get them out of your life, because the only way that you're going to grow and progress in your faith is by removing the things that cause you to fall into temptation. For a lot of you, that may be a relationship. For some of you, that may be your cell phone, websites, social media, music, games, movies. If it's causing you to sin and tempting you to do things that are unchristlike, you need to get rid of them. We need to be sold out to Christ because otherwise we're no better than the sons of Sceva trying to invoke Christ's name and we don't even know him. So how are we genuine followers? So this linking piece between genuine followers and Christ is genuine faith. So instead of being con artists or being charlatans trying to just invoke the name of Christ without even knowing him, how do we look like genuine believers, genuine followers? The sons of Sceva were lacking genuine faith. They were lacking this link to Christ because all they cared about was the authority that came behind his name. They didn't care about having a relationship with Christ. They just cared about the benefit and the, the power and the renown that it would give them if the community heard that they had exercised a demon. The emphasis or the, the drive of our faith, the drive of our desire is not what God can do, but God himself. Not what Christ can do, but Christ himself. And so genuine faith looks like us genuinely following after Christ, regardless of what he can do for us. Because we should be in love with Jesus, not just what benefits it comes with it. And so the sons of Sceva thought using Christ's name would be enough to use his power, but it wasn't. 
Satan will use charlatans or use false believers or phonies or con artists to impersonate genuine Christians and to impersonate God himself because the world is not going to be able to tell the difference. There's a lot of people that stand in pulpits on a weekly basis that are teaching lies. But because we don't know the Bible like we should, people buy into it and they believe it. And so we have to know what we believe. We have to have genuine faith. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15 tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light and his followers disguise themselves as servants of Christ. So there are people out here that are legitimately trying to deceive you. But how can you tell the difference? It takes genuine faith. If you don't know what you believe, how are you going to believe it? If you don't know what you believe, how are you going to live it out? Many people use the title of Christian, but it's in name only. They only know Jesus on an informational basis. They might be able to tell you a Bible story, but they can't tell you what Christ did in their life. They might be able to tell you a Bible story, but they can't tell you why they follow Christ, why Christ is so significant, what Christ means to us as believers. Because all they care about is going to heaven. They don't care about knowing Christ. They don't want the relationship. They just want the benefit of calling themselves a Christian, and that's not Christianity. So let me ask you this. Is there somebody here like that tonight? You may tell people you're a Christian, but it's in name only. Your actions reflect those who don't care about the person of Christ, only the reputation, only the benefit that comes along with it. We may never stand before a demon trying to exercise it, but one day we will stand before God, and if we don't know Christ, we're going to be cast out of His presence. If all you do is claim to be a Christian, but you never actually have genuine faith in this genuine relationship with Christ, he's going to cast you out because he tells us that, you know, I never knew you. So if God doesn't know you, it doesn't matter how much you know about him. So there needs to be a relationship. There needs to be a mutual linking thing to bring you to Christ. Relationship, genuine faith. Those things have to bring us to Christ. To be a genuine follower doesn't mean just using his name, but belonging to him having genuine faith, and living this life inside and out. When Jesus was doing the Sermon on the Mount, all of Israel had learned from the Old Testament that it was about your outside actions. Like There was implication about internal actions, but Jesus, when he did the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about these things, saying, you know, it's a sin to murder somebody, but let me tell you this, it's even more of a sin to hate someone. Because hate is what leads to murder. If our internal actions, internal thoughts, if our heart does not match Christ, then our external actions do not matter. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. If God has not changed your heart and brought you into a relationship with Him, those things do not matter because you're not doing it for Christ. You're just working. You have the knowledge, but you don't have the the relationship. And so the missing link between us going from being a charlatan to a real follower of Christ is genuine faith. Third, the incorrigible crowd. Does anyone know what incorrigible means? Yeah, they're unwilling to be corrected. If I asked your parents, they'd probably say that some of you are incorrigible. If you ask my wife, she would probably tell you that I'm incorrigible. Sometimes. Unwilling to be corrected. As in, you can't tell them that they're wrong. And even if you do, they're not going to listen. So this whole crowd, and I'm going to summarize it because it's 20 verses, or 21 verses. So I'm going to summarize it and tell you guys what happened. Um, The third event in chapter 19 is a lengthy one. So people were getting angry about Paul leading people to Christ. And so a man named Demetrius, he was a silversmith and he crafted idols um, for pagan worship. For Artemis, he created a frenzy or a riot in the city. So he gathered up all the other silversmiths and told them, hey, this Paul guy is, is causing people to stop buying stuff from us, causing people to stop worshiping at the temple. What are we going to do about it? And so his intent was to to end this Christian movement so that he can continue making money off of selling idols. It even goes so far as to say that, that Paul is teaching them that idols are not real, that, God, that gods do not exist in man-made things. And so his whole livelihood, his whole business is out the window if they continue converting to Christianity. And so as a result, the other silversmiths all shouted, Great is Artemis, the god of the Ephesians. So they had their rally cry, their battle cry. They were excited because they had pride in their city and they wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. So great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So they caused a riot. And then we see the Gaius and Aristarchus. Gaius, we learned last week, converted to Christianity. Um, And Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions, when the riot happened, they grabbed them and drug them into the theater. 
So they basically had this mob rule going on to where all of the people in the city gathered into this theater and they were ready to execute anybody that could get their hands on that was a Christian because they wanted to put a stop to it. And so they dragged them in there. Paul was trying to get in, but Christians, the Christians in Ephesus and some of his friends that were leaders in Asia would not let him go in because they felt that either it was going to cause the situation to get worse if he spoke or they were going to kill Paul as well. And so they forbade him from going in and would not let him go in. And so these two men were kind of standing there just waiting to see what was going to happen with the crowd. And so most of the people that were in there didn't even know why they were there. You want to say that? Perfect example. All of y'all were looking, trying to figure out what I was looking at. There's nothing there. But see, this is what happens a lot of times with crowds. You know, there's, let's say there's a fight. Yes. At the football game Friday night, there was a fight that happened like 10 feet away from me. Yes. But so everyone starts trying to gather around, but they don't really know what's going on. All they hear is noise, and so they go and try to figure out what's going on. This is what happens to the entire city. They hear these men saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so they're like, what in the world is going on? They see the crowd moving into the theater. All of them go in there, and all of this noise is going on. And so no one really knows why they're there. They just know that they're there. No one knew why we were staring at the ceiling. You were just staring at the ceiling. So awesome job. But... They were trying to figure out what was going on. So this man named Alexander goes to speak. And he was probably a leader in the city. We don't know if he was a Christian or if he was a Jew. If he was a Christian, he was probably trying to defend Paul. If he was a Jew, he was probably just trying to keep Jews from being killed. But he speaks and tries to talk to the people. But once people realized that he was Jewish, they started shouting again. So you guys play, um, who do you play Friday? New Hampshire. They're the Phoenixes, right? So it makes me, when, this whole scene makes you think of like a pep rally. So let's, let's do this as an example. Sure. So let's have this half of the room shout, go Jackets, or this part. We'll have this part shout, go Phoenixes, because that's, you know, too many syllables. So go. Go Jackets! <laughs> so much enthusiasm. But they're shouting, and they're shouting, and they're shouting, and they're shouting, and the Bible says that they're doing this for two hours. So could you imagine having a pep rally for two hours and all yours? Go Jackets! Go Phoenixes! Go Jackets! Go Phoenixes! Go Aloha But, and then, so you're hearing all this, and then you stand in the middle of the crowd, and it all just blends together. And it will drive you insane. And so they're just shouting for two hours straight because they're not willing to listen to what Alexander has to say. They're not willing to listen to what anyone has to say. And so finally the mayor steps in and he tries to placate the crowd. So he tries to calm them down or make them less angry. He tells the people, like, look, everybody knows our history. We know that a meteor came and Artemis was on the side of the meteor and now we worship her because of this and this and this. Yeah, it's pagan religion. But... Artemis is um, one of the gods in their religion. And there's a point to be made that we don't know who she is. But so he goes and tells them the history of the city. He gets them to calm down because he, you know, strokes their pride about how awesome Ephesus is and Artemis and the temple and everything else. And then he says, look, you know, Paul and these other guys have not robbed anybody. They've not blasphemed against Artemis. And if Demetrius, the guy that initially caused the problem, had an issue, he could go to the courts. But either way, it's going to be handled in a lawful assembly. It's not going to be settled by the mobs. I know some people today that need to learn that. But he said, look, we're not going to go crazy. We're not going to punish these men because they've not done anything illegal. But if Demetrius has an issue, he can go to the judge and he and that other person can talk it out. And so he eventually dismisses them and tells them to go home. And so I kind of wonder, you know, like when we look at the mobs and everything that happens on TV, when you go to a pep rally or something and everybody's cheering, whether anything's actually accomplished or not, we don't know, but everyone's kind of excited because they feel like their voice has been heard. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you cheer for 30 minutes for the Jackets or whoever, and you're like, man, I had a really good part in cheering for the team. And so you go home and you feel kind of satisfied, or if you're a cheerleader and you're rah rah shish buying and everyone's excited for you. Yeah. Twirl. 
But you, you, you're almost like encouraging the crowd to keep going and be excited and everything else. But I wonder if these people, even though nothing actually was accomplished, I wonder if they felt like they did something. Because they spent two hours shouting. They didn't allow the other person to say what they needed to say. And so they silenced someone. They probably did. I mean, because we see it today with cancel culture. It's not about the truth anymore. It's about shouting the loudest. But there was something that was missing from the crowd. There was something that was missing from the crowd, and that was humility. The crowd wanted to stand up for something that they felt mattered, which is a very good thing. We should stand up for things that we feel matter. So they had something that could actually be you know, commended or they could be encouraged about, but the problem is what they wanted to stand up for was a false belief, and so it wasn't worth standing up for. So standing up for something we believe in is commendable, but make sure you're standing up for Christ and for truth. I'm not encouraging you to go shout in somebody's face for two hours. You know, Jesus is Lord, but I mean, if you do, have, have at it. But they needed humility. So for us, how can we learn from this? How can we be correctable? The crowd was satisfied with being wrong. They did not care that they were wrong. All they cared about was that they had the final word. A lot of times when you argue with people, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, because most of the time we figure out about halfway through the argument that we're wrong, but we're so prideful that we want to finish it out. We want to make sure that we are right even though we're wrong. Yeah. We're going to lean all the way into it, and we got to get the last word. So you're like, you're talking, and the other person's pretty much giving up. You're like, that's what I thought, and you walk away. That's pretty much what the crowd was doing. You know, Alexander was probably laying in the floor in the fetal position crying, and the crowd's like, that's what I thought. Yeah, Artemis. And just like walked off. But they were cheering for the wrong thing. They were cheering for something that was false, something that was a lie. And so how do we get corrected? We do that through humility. And so that linking thing between a correctable crowd, between us as believers who can be corrected, is humility, to be able to understand and be connected to Christ. And so they, had, they believed this story about Artemis and were unwilling to hear anything else. Kind of like some people that they know that what they believe is not entirely true, but they're not willing to admit that they're wrong. Everyone has opinions, but opinions don't mean that it's true. It just means that's your opinion, your interpretation of things. Yes. It's not a fact. There you go. Everyone has opinions, but facts don't change. So they were so sold out on this idea that what they thought was right, even though it was really wrong, they were unwilling to allow anyone else to speak. They were unwilling to allow anyone else to have a word in the matter. And so they were satisfied with being wrong, but like the crowd, rather than being right and standing out, they wanted to be a part of the crowd. It didn't matter if what was going on was wrong, kind of like whenever a fight happens and all of you gather around the fight to see what's going on instead of trying to go find administration and getting them to stop it. No, you don't need to do that. But it's, it's difficult to stand against the crowd, especially at your age. At my age, you don't really care anymore. But you guys are still at a very young age to where you want people to like you. You want to make a good impression. And a lot of you, unfortunately, not just in our youth group, but you know, a lot of teenagers, a lot of young adults, they're willing to sacrifice their morals. Some of them are willing to sacrifice their beliefs just so they can fit in with the crowd. But if you're trying to fit in with a crowd that is heading towards hell, you're making the wrong choice. Because standing for truth, a lot of times you're going to be standing alone. But you've got to have that humility to understand that. And so there's a couple quotes I want to share with you. Benjamin Franklin wrote that a mob was a monster with heads enough but no brains. Basically saying that everyone is gathering together but nobody really knows what they're thinking. And so when we stand for things that are untrue, we're basically just a bunch of zombies. We're basically just willing to follow the crowd, whatever they're doing, without actually putting thought into it. That's what was going on when you guys were staring at the ceiling with me. That's what was going on when everyone ran into the theater trying to figure out what was going on. They were focused on what was in front of them instead of focusing on what was true or what was right. And so one of the most important qualities that we must have as a Christian is humility. Before Christ, we are wicked sinners. To be correctable is to be willing to admit when we're wrong. The early church father, Augustine of Hippo, penned these words in the 4th or 5th century. And this is one of my favorite quotes. It said, It was pride that made angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. And what he's saying is that every sin boils down to pride. Everything that we do is a pride issue. Do we trust God enough or do we trust ourselves more? 
And so when we look at Satan and look at the fallen angels, all of them allowed their pride to get the best of them. And so it turned them from being servants of God to servants of evil. And so they rejected God because of their pride, because they felt like they were better or more powerful than God, and God cast them into hell. And with humanity, it's humility that makes us as angels, not into angels. We do not turn into angels. But angels were created to be servants or messengers of God. And the only way that we can have a genuine relationship with genuine faith in Christ is through humility. Because it means that we're willing to say, God, I don't know everything. God, I need to trust in you. And so it causes us to become servants, first and foremost. It causes us to be willing to stand up for truth, first and foremost, instead of trying to follow the crowd. And so it's, really, it's a really cool phrase or a really cool quote that he had from like the 4th or 5th century. But none of us like being told that we're wrong. Does anyone like being told you're wrong? No. Is that why they changed the pen on the test that's no longer red anymore because it's too offensive to people? What? Yeah, like they don't use red pens on tests whenever you get something wrong anymore. No, right, but they didn't care when I was a kid. There was red all over that thing. They wanted to hurt us as much as they could. But no one likes being told that they're wrong, and the world is teaching us that truth does not matter. What matters is how you feel. What matters is your experience. And so when you have that philosophy in life, when you believe that the only thing that matters is your experience, you're going to stand up for things that don't matter. You're going to stand up for things that go completely against our faith as Christians. Partially because you may not know any better, but also because you get so wrapped up in emotion and so wrapped up in feelings that you allow your identity to be controlled by that instead of being controlled by Christ. And so the world teaches us we are how we feel. It's where Scripture tells us that we are created in the image of God. That as believers in Christ, we should have the image of Christ and not the image of the world. And so part of maturing as a person and as a Christian is being willing to admit when we're wrong and to do what is right. Without humility, the willingness to admit that we're wrong, we will continue shouting against the truth until we breathe our last breath. If we are not humble if we do not have that relationship with Christ, then we are going to argue with God. We are going to argue with anyone that tries to correct us for the rest of our lives. And we become bitter people that are going to be separated from God for all eternity. So for this crowd, the truth was literally right in front of them, but they would not stop talking long enough to hear it. They would not be quiet long enough to hear the truth. The truth is presented in front of many people who sit in this church and churches all across the world on a weekly basis. But many people are going to choose pride. Because they're more worried about what people are going to think. I got baptized when I was in VBS when I was four years old. What are they going to think now if I come down and, and repent? They're going to think less of me. Or I'm not perfect. How am I going to get saved? Or they have to think about what they have to give up. Or that, that some things that they're going to have to change. And so instead of repenting and trusting Christ, instead of taking these books and burning them to separate themselves from their old life, they would rather choose their pride and be separated for eternity. Because you're not willing to stand up and be bold and say, yes, I'm willing to surrender my life to Christ. So tonight we address three different events in Acts 19, and there being a missing link between each one of them. And so I've got all of those here. So for the incomplete converts, they lacked that necessary relationship. They had all the, the knowledge that they needed, but it was through the relationship brought through by the Holy Spirit that they were able to be united with Christ. It brought unity with Christ through this relationship. For the impostering charlatans, they knew the name of Christ, but the missing link was genuine faith. So as genuine believers, we have genuine faith so that we can know Christ genuinely. For the incorrigible crowd, they had the drive to stand up for something, which is great. You should be willing to stand up for things. But unfortunately, what they were standing up for was a lie. The missing link that they needed was humility. And so for us to be Christians, to be correctable, we have to have humility to be able to listen to when we're wrong and repent so that we can be like Christ and we can grow closer to Jesus. So let me ask you this before you guys go to small groups. Do you find yourself in any of these categories? Do you lack the relationship with Christ to go out and impact the world? Do you lack the genuine faith to follow Christ and live under His authority? Do you lack humility to be conformed to Christ's image instead of the world? I want to challenge you to think those things through. Is there a missing link in your life for you to have a relationship with Christ?